include including an event about uh, yeah makers at risk has has emerged really from the expression of experiences or experienced need no With, within the gig community and so for this reason i'm i'm extra content that that we can that we can have this session today i'm kirsty wissenmar for those who don't know and i will be your host today so yeah it's in the very nature of making to to address challenges where they locally emerge with concrete and, and practical place-based community held solutions and of course this results in an increasing number of makers operating in context of distress and and various dimensions of risk and in times of advanced tech technologies targeting maker spaces or makers is, is becoming an increasing risk factor and yeah well as we speak the, the world is shattered by the most unacceptable uh, acts of violence and, and repression. And these days, actually, it feels quite surreal to, to go on with, with work as, as usual. But um, I think cultivating support and, and safe, safeguarding mechanisms, especially in this these times, are a very important thing to do and to address uh, with our communities. And so I'm, I'm happy we're here today, actually. So... Yeah, the, the thing is that to date, we are not aware of existing makers at risk programs. And at the same time, the human rights defender and journalist protection community has been doing outstanding frontline work, uh, support since many, many years or decades, preparedness work, emergency response uh, work for a long time, and is continuously adapting their mechanisms to the ever changing technological um, sophistication and, and subsequent risk environment that, that we have. And well, community and, and cross-disciplinary collaboration, I think is really key. And it's for this reason that we believe that there's an outstanding potential in bringing our two communities together and to explore together where we can create synergies and in order to, to create safeguarding support mechanisms also for the, the maker community. And I'm incredibly grateful for the contributions of our panelists today, Naris, Konstantin and Ani. Let me briefly introduce you. So Naris, Arif is one of our giggers and actually you you are the one who, who brought this to light because you were the one who, who raised the, the issue during our last um, global community gathering earlier this year. So thank you for this. Uh, Naris founded uh, Science Camp, uh, Makerspace and, and Fab Lab, fostering local innovation and is, promotes entrepreneurship and STEM education, aiming to, to reshape society and advance digital learning through his extensive and tireless engagement in his community and, and wider country context. And then welcome to Konstantin Leonenko, also one of our giggers. And Konstantin has designed, built, managed numerous digital fabrication workshops in Ukraine and the UK. <laughs> and, and well, most recently, uh, Konstantin has led three mobile maker teams as part of the Toloka project. He will introduce it today uh, a mobile makerspace project that is delivering humanitarian maker solutions wherever it, it matters in the in the region in the country and then warm-hearted welcome to to annie salmon annie serves as security and humanitarian advisor to free press unlimited a renowned international press freedom organization that supports media and journalists worldwide since many many years and annie is also the co-founder of exile uh, excel hub supporting at-risk journalists and human rights defenders in Excel, uh, Excel and launched Packvotes, the first digital newsroom to cover Pakistan's 2013 elections, monitoring violence via social media, and authored Speak Up Barometer Pakistan, exploring digital participation and freedom of expression. A warm, warm welcome to the three of you. And if it's okay, Naris, I, I would ask you to start with your story, your context, so I'd hand over to you. Would you yes. like to share your screen? I think you you already have access, right? So you yes. could just go ahead and do so. I can start, but I never prepare anything because this topic cannot be documented in a very obvious way. Uh, yes, we are makers. 
and we are have a 10 years now in Iraq working in maker movement, uh, importing the positive values from everywhere, from our, uh, our uh, international friends and countries we are visiting. Several hours ago, we were in Athens taking part in a robotic competition. Um, this type of uh, activities for people like us or any people want to develop the humanity, the, the country, and want to do positive thing toward, can see us in very positive way. But there is another story related to another side of reality related to the uh, people in opposition can affect our life, maybe official oppositions or in a power of any type like militia leaders or something similar. They can see us in different way. They can see uh, makers, journalists, and anybody uh, with their relation with the Western world can speak more than one language like English and can uh, make a connections and get supported for their project and ideas in a different way. It is related to the stereotyping about the relation with the Western world, especially in conflict times, like what happened nowadays in the, in the Middle East. For makers, it may be uh, more dangerous or maybe uh, not easy to explain who we are and what we are doing, especially with our uh, uh, values and our struggling for being sustainable from financial part. So our projects are not, uh, looks like a business for them. So they cannot understand that we are, uh, our motivation is related to the development and what we are do or why we choose the Western world to develop our countries and society. In this way, they can very easily understand us like a places can provide technology for terrorism or any type of uh, tech dependent activities related to the dark side of politics, like making things very dangerous or a type of telecommunication devices and many, many things they can uh, make a stories about. So for us, we think it is uh, very easy to be in a very bad situation and need to provide many explanation. In this way, uh, or in this point, it is very specific for us to put a light on. If we get any of a trust in the other side of who will ask us who we are and what you are doing, if we trust them, or trust that we will find somebody with a scientific background to understand our explanations that may be somehow safer or feel more safe. Unfortunately, all the time, this type of systems, human resources related to a type of technical ignorance and a mindset full with a Stero uh, negative stereotype and conspiracy theory. So it is not easy to explain a place with machine, with many young people, boys and girls come together, speak English and develop uh, many uh, flashing light <laughs> stuff like Arduino, electronics, everything. And if there is somebody from the other side want to understand or discover what if they want to make some media, make the other youth in the country feel uh, afraid or to scare them or to keep them down in the protest, they will look for any type of people like us or a project like spa our spaces to be like an um, example for what they can do. So sometimes it's not related to us directly, but related to what we do with the youth. So we are like, we could be a uh, example for what the governments or militias can do with people against their ideologies or um, thoughts 
or their behavior in the economy and politics in very obvious way because we are somehow uh, appear in media people know us and know what we do so sometimes uh, people like us and journalists may get a bad thing happen to them just to be an example to what we can do for people like those and we don't want uh, to answer, ask them the right questions or we are not care about what they are doing. What I try to say that some systems or regimes use ignorance like a weapon against people like us. So this is part of what I can share with you about what we are facing in the other side of our very bright and funny story of developing youth, country, society, and supporting tech-dependent entrepreneurship in Iraq. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naris. I, I think I, I'd like to, well, thanks so much, first of all, for these insights. And we, we will later, obviously, really dive into where you also concretely to your situation um, see the need or what kind of support mechanisms um, you you consider really needed and and then we can can look into how yeah how we can how this can unfold i'd i'd like to directly hand to to constantine who comes from a different current situation and and also toloka is a very sp special makerspace uh, program in the sense that it's a whole fleet of mobile makerspaces who proactively um tap into um, situations of urgency. So I'd like to, to hand to you, Konstantin. So we, we have these two perspectives as a as a point of departure. Thank you, Kirsty. <clears throat> I'll quickly share just my uh, browser window. That's my favorite way of presenting. Uh, a quick overview uh, where I started. Uh, this is the uh, Fab Lab that I built in Donetsk in 2012. Uh, so you can see this is our beautiful little space. That's our first uh, 3D printer and laser cutter. Uh, young students working on their projects, learning to solder, all kind of beautiful, typical maker stuff. Uh, and in uh, 2014, one guy who was our regular visitor, who brought his kids, his uh, family there, he, by the time he brought a big army with him, uh, people with machine guns and tanks, and they're like, well, you have a good sport here, and we need a base for our new army. So they just came and took it, and they turned the place into uh, one of the most nasty, notorious prisons uh, in, the ter in the temporary occupied areas. Uh, uh, so, yeah, just sort of a bit of context where I'm coming from. Then uh, later, I've been setting up labs in uh, along the contact line uh, in places like Severodonetsk, Mariupol, Volnavaja, Popasna. It's all along the uh, edge of the occupied territories. And uh, in 2022, all of those labs were destroyed, uh, physically bombed. They physically don't exist anymore. Uh, all the people, the managers I trained, they fled to different places uh, with very different stories. And then after that, kind of the last thing that uh, sort of, this is my 12 years of trying to build a lab in Ukraine. Uh, so a lot of labs have been built there uh, alongside, uh, which I'm very happy for. Uh, but my last attempt at building labs in Ukraine was uh, together with the Toloka project, uh, where we had where Vicky Wenzelman, uh, who is, as I understand, uh, partially responsible for Gig as a community existing. Uh, so with her with her support and uh, the rest of the kind of JZ Gig and Hiva team, so we built uh, and operated for one and a half years. Uh, this kind of fabulous trucks uh, fitted with all the typical fab lab machines. Uh, they have 
Oh, no, okay, there's a little bit older, yeah. So we built some more new labs, like this one in Chernihiv, uh, and like uh, there's one in Ruskovets. Oh, this is, uh, I think this is uh, corner top. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, but this this is all been kind of a very humanitarian uh, focused sort of a bit more of R and D type effort. Because the hypothesis was that, well, if you support the makers, they can fix their own local problems. Uh, with if you give them the tools, the skills, the support, uh, and uh, we were trying to validate this hypothesis. And in some ways, we supported it. In some ways, we showed that uh, it doesn't always work, especially in times of kind of acute crisis like a war. Uh, uh, and uh, what we discovered is that. Uh, in the global maker community, there's a lot of beautiful, very interesting ideas and ambitions that people are aspiring uh, to create some great solutions. Uh, but for those solutions to be actually usable in the context of acute humanitarian crisis, they cannot be just kind of student projects that are prototyped and uh, kind of tried out somewhere. This cannot be kind of a poster presentation. Uh, People need tried and tested stuff that works. Uh, and that, that, is, that is one of the biggest kind of bottlenecks that we found in implementing is that uh, we were lacking this portfolio of kind of established, well-developed projects that we can actually build and deploy. Uh, that's what I'm continuing doing now. I mean, Toloka funding has run out, uh, but the network and kind of the activity that has been set up in Ukraine, I continue working with this community, uh, taking some of these projects a little bit further. Uh, but it just shows that, yeah, for example, one example, uh, what I'm talking about, there was in uh, the summer of 22, I think. Uh, yeah, there was, uh, the Russians have destroyed a huge water dam, which has uh, flooded huge areas of southwestern Ukraine, a huge catastrophe, thousands and thousands of houses uh, uh, underwater, millions of people displaced, uh, and huge shortage of drinking water for a long time. Uh, and we reached out to the community searching for kind of solutions. Uh, and we found a bunch, but none of them were at that stage where we could just say, kind of put them in place. Uh, so nothing could replace kind of commercial we were not, I mean, when people had to choose whether they need drinking water, whether they go with just kind of try to test it on the shelf commercial thing for which they fundraise however money they need, or they go kind of exploratory, risky way, making trying to make something on the cheap uh, sort of uh, make a style and hopefully something comes out. And in a situation where it's about your life and water, just like, no, <laughs> that's, it's not a choice. People go for something that they they uh, have faith in. Uh, so that's just kind of some reflections, uh, some ideas. What, uh, but that's why it is important to kind of to have to build gradually this sort of knowledge base of projects that can be deployed like this, and that we can anticipate that he is kind of. Uh, I mean, there are some attempts at doing things like this. There are things like what is it? So 3D printed uh, medical supplies uh, like Gaia tourniquets and things like this. Uh, but again, with those with those devices, it's so uh, I mean that that's kind of the the fuzzy area is that there are a lot of makers who believe that this is the right thing to do and that this can yield some value, and there are people whose lives depend on it. Uh, and when talking to uh, when talking to paramedics who save soldiers' lives, so like these three D printed tourniquets that we're coming across are the most horrible thing uh, because they're not working well. People rely on them uh, in situations where they should not. It's, so it's they better not have any tourniquet. That's sort of an amateurish thing that was built and kind of gifted to somebody. So that's kind of this question of quality control. Uh, in this acute humanitarian situations is paramount. And how to address that? So there's kind of, I think that that's, that should be a very important point of discussion and deploying these kind of things. 
And uh, Toluca succeeded in some things like this. It failed in some other uh, projects like that. But overall, I think that's kind of the main point that we can take from it is uh, uh, that we have sort of uh, showed this discrepancy between things that people really need and the things that kind of make a community has to offer uh, or kind of can engage in. And uh, that's kind of connecting these two worlds is where there's a lot of work needs to be done just from that interface. Uh, yeah, I can talk mm -hmm. for forever. So if we, we just uh, if we can interrupt or start asking questions, so we move to other stage that, uh, yeah. I might ask you something, actually. Thank you so much, first of all. Um, and yeah, I mean, you you demonstrate quite clearly um, the, the risks in in concrete hot conflict zones of having a physical space and how it can be compromised or just disappear in in an eye blink. Um, so then it, after now after you mentioned these two scenarios, I was like, yeah, so that's something you to potentially bypass with having a mobile maker space fleet, no? So you don't have that base, the tar targetable base. However, I mean, thanks for sharing your learnings, first of all, because this is what we need, no? Honest reflections on what works and what doesn't work to, to then strive. So this is much more, however, like a debate looking into uh, worse the maker movement positioned in relation and collaboration to traditional humanitarian organizations, no? Um, when it comes to certain resource uh, supply, et cetera. So that's an interesting this conversation and very important conversation in itself. But I would really like to briefly go back to, um, can you can you share a bit with us? So having having your mobile maker spaces, how how did that then look like? Into how have been communication decisions been made, and how did communication happen for how you would move and where you would go into operation, and and where what were the experiences the the risk experience, so to say, um, you have experienced there? Yeah, uh, let me try. Uh... I'll share this screen with you. Uh, wait, did you, did you, did you share? Uh, uh, not this. I need to share a window. Uh, do, 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 just a moment. What is that window? Yeah, so uh, choosing kind of what we engage with. Uh, I mean, that, that was mostly my job. Uh, and that was the for me the biggest challenge to kind of to evaluate uh, where can we be most effective. Uh, so just a moment. wait, stop share, share screen. Uh, is it which one is that? Oh, po po. Uh, wait, why? Safari. So yes, okay, this one. So this is how our database uh, looked for coordinating all our activities. Uh, where we try to structure, because there's so many different kind of continuously moving uh, pieces of the puzzle. So that some of the most important things were uh, kind of uh, requests uh, that we had coming in, so uh, needs. So this is the need. So this is people coming to us with very specific things. Can you come to us and do something, something? Uh, then we see which of the Toloka, uh, which of the Toloka teams are available in which in which area. Uh, then we looked at the kind of uh, our schedules uh, at our calendars uh, and. Uh, we even had a map for all the interventions. I think it's on the, you can still see it on the Toloka website. Uh, so here. Uh, okay, there's somewhere there was a map that was, oh yeah, here it is. Uh, these are just kind of the latest things. Uh, and uh, yeah, you see, so uh, we, uh, went to we mostly were operating in the in the safe part 
So it was on a couple of occasions that we approached uh, areas where uh, we could hear artillery fire or we could see drones and rockets flying above our heads. Uh, there was one uh, intervention where we wake up, no, uh, well, basically, yeah, uh, I think we wake up in the morning, uh, bring our coffee, uh, and uh, it was here close, <clears throat> not in Zaporizhia, that's okay, that was something different, uh, something new, it was uh, somewhere here, around the, color. ah, yeah, here. Yes, it was part of this uh, part of this intervention, uh, and uh, so we went kind of renovating houses uh, that were destroyed during the floods. Uh, and uh, so here, actually, you can see people carrying carrying water. Uh, that's that's what they had to do all the time. Uh, that was the only kind of water source, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean. On the morning we woke up and we were bringing coffee that you could hear just kind of machine gun fire kind of somewhere close by. You can't see it. But if you can already hear machine gun fire, uh, that means it's kind of the action is pretty close. Uh, luckily, we never, we never got into kind of any extreme situations, none of our teams, but our Akhtirka team that is based on the very... Uh, northeast part of Ukraine. Uh, they, uh, yeah, so Simui, Okhtirka, so our Toluca 3 team is based here. Uh, and as you can see that this is already kind of uh, border with Russia. Mm. And uh, this Graivon, so this Velika Pisarivka, we went uh, installing uh, temporary windows. Uh, that's where we were hearing again, kind of artillery working across the uh, across the border, and that's mm -hmm. where a lot of uh, action has been happening at different times. So Akhtirka team, uh, they are always sort of packed and ready to move to leave any moment, ready yeah, to move. Yeah. Uh, them and their team and their families. Uh, so they they live in a very different world compared to people in the one of Kivsk, which is over here. Mm -hmm. Even compared to people in Kiev, so that's uh, uh, it was also a challenge, kind of how to keep the team operating in such different environments, uh, how to kind of align their work in a constructive way. Uh, Thanks, but awesome. I I um, jump in here a bit because I'm conscious about the time, and we yeah. want to bring Annie into the conversation. I just really wanted to get get a bit more info on how how on operational level you this actually worked so now in terms of how exposed were actually your itineraries where your locations um in what way you you would communicate and, and make your planning so that gave us a bit of an insight which i think is important to also for annie to understand and so i really uh, we, love we were, to... we were 100% transparent to the to the outside mm -hmm. world uh, because mm -hmm. we were communicating it purely as humanitarian thing, like no affiliation with any military activities. Uh, that was by by design. There was a brief from the GSZ that we got. Uh, I mean, the labs that we set up, uh, I mean, maybe this is the part you want to cut out uh, when publishing it. Uh, uh, but the labs that we set up, of course, we could not tell them what they should do with the equipment. Where we leave the equipment there, their lab is there. They decide for themselves what they do. Uh, and a lot of them engaged in uh, <clears throat> uh, printing military uh, parts, uh, parts for bombs, for drones, uh, prototyping other kind of military equipment. Uh, mm -hmm. But it is, none of them communicated publicly. Yeah, just because yeah. you do, if you do, you become immediately kind of a target on the Russian hit list. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it's important to keep this as as covered. But yeah. yes, it is happening. Everybody has a 3D printer. Uh, print something mm -hmm. for the what I'd like I to bring, to... bring Annie in because time is running. And I, I'd really love to, yeah, first of all, hear about your work. You have extensive experience in very diverse humanitarian contexts. Um, so welcome, Annie. And um, yeah, happy to, to hear from your work. And then... 
your account on you know what how you how yeah your response to to what you've heard and how that relates and certain situations really uh, really relate to to scenarios from other human rights defender communities okay thank you so much i hope you can hear me and you can also see my screen um so um it's very interesting rather than going through the uh, slideshow or something i would just continue um mainly with uh, basically uh, free press unlimited's work as uh, you mentioned earlier i um, keep like two hats i'm co-founder of exile hub which is a grassroots initiative um that works right now on thai burma border and burma right now since after the coup it's a conflict zone there's an active war and after uh uh ukraine they're like uh, the second highest uh, air strikes um uh, but somehow we, um, myanmar is that conflict zone that doesn't get much media attention or it's a very dark very uh, blind spot for everyone so whenever i get an opportunity i uh, try to bring the example of a conflict zone which is not much heard which doesn't get uh, much attention as compared to ukraine for example because of proximity to europe or being a very uh, as we are being told many times about of geopolitical you know and uh, strategic depth myanmar has doesn't you know its neighbors don't care about uh, what's happening in myanmar but coming to uh, a free press unlimited i'll start with that for free, uh, because um, with free press unlimited we particularly work in countries with limited press freedom and there are many countries it's like all around the world uh, uh, from asia to africa and uh we have a global protection uh, support system in which in 2023 we have supported more than 1000 journalists and we responses we usually respond to a crisis for example a recent crisis in lebanon we have like dedicated support system and networks that's what we work and build on uh when i say networks and communities i talk about uh, media makers uh, or media professionals we have stopped uh, very intentionally calling them only journalist because uh, there's lots of like um, confusion when it comes to the definition of who is a journalist who is a blogger who is a just a you know maker so uh, that's a very safe uh, uh, word for us to use when we um, do any advocacy or talk to individuals or states um, as you can see like uh, fp has responded to all bigger crises and how they have responded uh, we have uh, responded is mainly the first request that comes to us is uh, about safety equipment and how to do like press kits uh, for example uh, uh, when journalists are also covering in myanmar's example in uh, coup 2021 they were the frontline defenders they were shot at as well although they were wearing press kits so how to train these frontline defenders be it media makers journalists whatever we call them hrds they need to also have very basic uh, trainings uh, uh, first aid trainings which in countries like myanmar many uh, times people don't have neither they have resources nor they have any equipment uh, present there then uh, mostly we get temporary relocation to prevent target you know that journalists would be killed or they would be directly targeted and we see in very repressive regimes in time and again be it uh, kenya or be it myanmar be it afghanistan we see a very uh, same trend of, uh, all around the world when it comes to safety and security of journalists that journalists are targeted because they are public most of the time and in many cases when we start working in exile with them we see that they go underground and um uh, request uh, coming back to that we also get like psychosocial support most of them have like ptsd and burnout for uh, facing high stress conditions and uh, direct or indirect uh, uh, trauma as well because they are the first ones who get all the pictures all the footage and they have to like you know make sure that are we going to put it to press or not then uh, there are also psychosocial uh, workshops uh, support for them that how to cope up with these environments imagine you are sitting in there in crisis for example a journalist right now inside uh, in sagaing for example in myanmar where there's like fear of air strike and then you're sending something there's no internet connection in myanmar right now you uh, even vpn is banned if you you're found by any like you know a police official or anyone uh, running around they can check your phone and you can be sentenced uh then we also have a totem which i'm sure some of you may know totem is uh, 
um, an online learning we offer to journalists or media makers that about their digital uh, safety and security. Uh, then I'll come quickly to Exile Hub because we are short of time as well. So Exile Hub is a very interesting, um, I'm very passionate about it. The story is like, it's like community of uh, women journalists and uh, women defenders. After the coup, they took up the charge and this, they started working with the international networks of uh, uh, women journalists or women media makers and uh, safety and security experts, digital experts, researchers to find to bring money for Myanmar. That was the main you know, uh, challenge because no one was ready to invest in Myanmar or even to save Myanmar, to give humanitarian aid to Myanmar. People were leaving Myanmar when uh, in 2021, the coup ha happened. Like uh, if I say I won't be, I think uh, be judged or uh, for that, that most of the uh, media development or uh, uh, development sector, they all closed their shops and ran away for their own safety and left the whole communities there. And that's the biggest challenge for us when we work, when I say we work with communities, whenever crisis happens, we start leaving the countries, be it Sudan, be it uh, Lebanon, be it uh, Myanmar. So those who are working very actively, they stop, they pause. And that's a beautiful time as well, because uh, when there's darkness, there's like, you know, some uh, good things coming out. And these uh, networks, they build local networks. So Exile Hub is a local network and it existed for, uh, do you have a question? <laughs> uh, just just exactly that, that uh, yeah. <clears throat> there's this beautiful quote that uh, in dark times, mm -hmm. it's easy to see bright people. Uh, and that, that's exactly yeah. what I wanted to, to kind of yeah. uh, confirm as well is that despite kind of yeah. horrible times, uh, yeah. the people you come in contact with is exactly yeah and that's what I've seen everywhere whenever I work for example be it Afghanistan be it Pakistan and like recently we were in Cambodia so these people are actually you know uh, if you tap on that and if you start supporting them they really amplify their efforts as well so with Exile Hub story is it's like they got together and with a little support now they have like more shelters around um, northern Thailand which actually gives safety and security to um, media makers and human rights defenders who are coming from Myanmar to Thailand for uh, some time, some stay. Some, a general trend we have seen from media makers and human rights defenders now is we are fourth, fourth year into it, that uh, all of them, they come for rest and retreat for a couple of months, and then they go back and work. And that's our aim and goal as well, that to keep them, you know, working. Because in many other countries, for example, if I give the example of Afghanistan, where I also work closely, we have seen a sudden, you know, decline in journalism and journalists. Like from the last three years, many journalists who went to exile in third countries, uh, they have stopped working as journalists. When we question them, very simple, that can you send anything, any work you have produced in the last six months, there's zero sometimes, which is very uh, sad. Uh, and our aim and goal is that all these critical thinker, thinkers or critical voices, they can continue to uh, collaborate for their countries. And what we see is in exile, it's the most difficult time to keep you know, staying resilient. So our flagship in exile, our flagship program is... Um, uh, mental health support. Uh, most of the team members or young Myanmar, uh, which many people call them Gen Zs who came out, they believe that it's not the first time it's happening in their country. And their parents were scarred in 88. They don't want to be scarred. And there's a lot of cultural uh, knowledge here as well, which they believe in that we need to get over it. We don't have, it's like continuity of what our parents have been through. They didn't bring change whatever happened and now again it's a cycle we have to break that cycle which is very interesting how they deal with it with mental health and uh, fourth year into it there's lots of acceptability lots of resilience workshops happening be it music therapy uh, be it uh, uh, art therapy be it yoga be it kickboxing I've also learned from this community that uh, it's not one thing for everyone we all are so different so diverse Someone really wants kickboxing class and someone wants to just sit and meditate. And then um, the third layer is uh, after, uh, you know, uh, first is psychosocial support. Second is relocation and accommodation providing to this community. And third is uh, providing them some skills 
updated skills, um, which is nowadays um, uh, young people and even older, like, you know, um, uh, generations, they would like to do podcasts in Myanmar a lot. Radio kind of is coming back in uh, uh, Myanmar because there's no internet left. <laughs> and this, uh, even VPN is so difficult. Recent a study, a research came and we were using tunnel bear and we were we got to know that tunnel bear doesn't work at all anymore in Myanmar. And then we have colleagues who are working inside for every app, they need an other VPN. Which brings me to this, you know, AI, uh, like when I was reading uh, your um, about the event, that why AI is a threat to freedom and safety in some, it is bringing lots of positive things for us as well. The lots of good digital tools, which uh, helps us, but it also put uh, frontline defenders in a lot of constraint, uh, particularly in Myanmar, where this, we see a lot of Chinese recognition, you know, uh, uh, surveillance cameras, which even before the coup, the NLD government also brought uh, as a safe city project. Uh, which really harmed journalists and frontline defenders when they were protesting. Uh, they, they, uh, and then we see very targeted, you know, that um, the junta has used these. Junta has also used the tech companies. And we also see that um, in countries where there's a repressive beat, uh, like any Mekong uh, region country or Afghanistan, Pakistan, India as well, we see uh, India has like uh, Pegasus as well. We this is all very much, you know, uh, um, a risk to freedom uh, and safety of journalists or storytellers or uh, makers, any kind of makers, be it like, you know, uh, 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 very tech savvy or be a like simple story maker, a storyteller, be it a comedian, for example, as well. So uh, then in Myanmar, uh, we have seen sudden increase in these uh, facial recognition, which is coming from China. And Reuters have done a very nice map as well, which I, I think you may not be able to see very clearly. I can share later. Um, then coming to existing mechanism and support systems. Um, they're already, whenever you work in communities, there's something very beautiful that you realize that there's always existing mechanisms or knowledge or some networks. If we tap on them, then our lives are much easier rather than... Um, external support, waiting for external support to come and save us. And I think it's a very severe, um, uh, I see a trend very much in uh, international development sector of savior complex that you are, someone is going to come from outside and help us. There's always, um, I believe um, uh, that there's always solutions available within the communities uh, and always networks help find protections uh, find, you know, we just need to go and find those communities and work with them rather than give our solutions. Because I am sure what uh, um, uh, Constantine is doing in Ukraine cannot be replicated in Myanmar situation. And what uh, we are doing in, you know, Myanmar may not be, you know, replicated. Maybe we do have uh, similarities and we can find like synergies to work together, but it's just, it can't be copy pasted solutions which I've seen in many, you know, uh, uh, places doing it. And context specific, as I mentioned, is very important. And international cooperation is very important, you know, because we, countries we, which are like from global south, we are anyway very poor. <laughs> uh, but then again, there's a contrast. On one hand, uh, there's a par paradox. Uh, people are poor, but whenever it comes to, you know, fundraising or whenever it comes to uh, crowdfunding, uh, initially, when Exile Hub started, um, they, uh, it was crowdfunding, $89,000. It was uh, to crowd funds and mostly like local people also bring in funds. And in Myanmar, we also see a history of like charity. People really like, you know, uh, they're very charitable. And uh, then, yeah, I think the end is, I would like to end it here. Uh, it's already 10 minutes that we beat media makers or makers Whoever it is, we need to collaborate because our situations are very similar. Our threats are similar, be it state oppression, be it wars, be it surveillance. Um, our threats are similar and we need to uh, share more knowledge, share more resources and um, strategies with each other and be there for each other. Because many a times I feel that I feel very isolated. The communities because uh, they all work underground, they all work for their own. And sometimes there's no one to listen to them. Uh, for example, in the last four years, uh, the media makers we work with, if you anyone who's reading like or focusing on Myanmar, you would notice that 
journalists don't use their names anymore hmm. or they use pen names so there's no no um, they are working which is amazing but it's a kind of profession where you would fight for your bylines and you have stopped doing it because of safety and security of your families your own self and um, uh, we always i should not use the word preach we always believe and you know say that always live for a next story your life is too precious and uh, working with young people i think that's the only you know way to keep them working rather than telling them to you know just go and join war so uh, <laughs> that's it and if you need more yeah. information i can send you the uh, uh, password for exile hubs website as well thank you thank you so much ani um fantastic insights and thanks so much to really also share uh, your contextual insight and the, uh, the story of, of the context you're working in, the Myanmar context to to shed, to, to give attention to, to the situation. I, there are so many aspects you mentioned where I, you know, I won't repeat like the, the different safety me mechanisms and at different stages of a process, no, like preparedness, uh, crisis response, um, et cetera, et cetera, the community building. So creating that holding shell around uh, around it no? so that people don't fall out of their activities as well in exile or or fleeing exactly. or whatever mm -hmm. um and especially the community aspect i'm so grateful that you you emphasize that so much and i think yeah we we see see so many similarities in different contexts however so also what you say about creating uh, let me call it cross community or cross disciplinary Uh, connections and and holding each other in each very specific context maybe not at country level but at regional level because wherever contexts are, are similar and we need similar things no so i think this is something from all these three inputs to to take with us for the moment um given the time i will straight open up and hand over to ricardo and ofre i think your hand is up as well i really want to to give you all the chance to to engage as well ricardo i think your hand was up first so if you would like to I'll start. Be super quick. thank you very much Cassie, for organizing and thank you for the participants i just have two comments that it's uh not related to the general thing of community and this thing but more related to the content of each talk uh the first i want to stories where he's blaming it by you know in his territory he's blaming it as an occidentalist because he brings all these western technologies but at the same time we in the west as geek we celebrate we celebrate novels and we celebrate ourselves as a global majority innovation style of innovation you know a, a grassroots style of innovation so Where is the portal? Where are we missing? You know, where, where is the place where we can't recognize us? You know, where we can't recognize ourselves and where we can't showcase ourselves in a different way. You know, so I think this is the first topic I was reflect upon. And the second topic was about Ennis. Uh, thank you very much for the amazing and insightful presentation uh, but about the insight when you brought the insight just a second here we are having okay when you brought the sorry uh, about territorially and centrally is what is the important so checking about the importance of some media outcasts and so on. So just getting Latin America's example because it portrayed that, you know, the amazing number of journalism, environmentalists, women murdered by partners, youth murdered by the police, indigenous murdered by exporting farmlands. It's not a war, you know, but must because um, maybe the activists call Concept in Latin America reflects to someone that is rebel, youth connected to this uh, teenager in communist idea, you know, so it's a pejorative thing to be a rebel in Brazil. And of course, because 
it's not in the media in Latin America, sorry, because we murder journalists, no matter where you are from. You know, this, you can see it, the number of international journalists murdering the Amazon rainforest when they tackle deep some questions on politics, drug dealing, environmental, things like this. Uh, we just murdered the journalists. So the difference is it's because of the territory, the geography is not important for the global aspect. And of course, because the artillery, the, the aim of the guns used real, they are old, they are deprecated, you know, it's not high-tech technology that we used to model, for example, just in the case of Brazil, 46,000 people a year. You know, in the last 10 years, 300,000 people were murdered just in Brazil. And in Colombia, it's more violent than Brazil. And Mexico, it's nightmare. You know? Yeah. So I think this, this topic of understanding perspective is related to, to interest that any brought to the table. You know, super important for example, how to support communities around the globe, you know? what is really happening and who is portraying what. Thank you, Ricardo. Re-emphasizing this certainly super important aspect. Being time conscious, I will give the word directly to Ofre at this point. Yeah, I, I was, uh, yeah, thank you for the talks. I think that they are very important. I think that they, they showcase how how we are dealing with with uh, yeah like important stuff and and resilience and community agency in several places. I I just would like to to share with you maybe super quickly a uh, short link over here. You can you can see in the chat. I don't know if I can share the screen, but but I was thinking about the the infrastructure that we are developing to to create resilient memory. So if I can, I will just share super quickly the. The skin, and if not, just uh, see the link. Uh, but the idea is that we have this small wiki for uh, the for the. Oh, I can. Okay, so we have this. Just this, to be uh, quick because we are quite at the end. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's fine. It's fine. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, the the idea is that we have this this. Uh, this is small uh, wiki. Uh, you can you can see that online, but it's for for the memory of, of wise women in Amazonas, in the in the Colombian Amazon. So the idea that in these in these places of, of uh, struggle, we need to also care for memory, for memory of the communities with infrastructures that are able to to work offline and to, to be deployed offline to to have this this resilient memory. And they are like also super super adaptable. So regarding what, what Annie was saying about like this idea of, of different contexts, uh, different needs, the, the idea that a single solution doesn't work for everybody, we have like this idea of, of like malleable systems for memory and for agency. And, and we are deploying that in Colombia in context with low connectivity or not connectivity or, in, or intermittent, intermittent connectivity. Uh, and for different stuff. So it's this, this infrastructure that is connecting a hacker space where we develop and deploy these, these infrastructures or a, a mushroom uh, uh, autonomy food community in the coffee region or the wise woman in Amazonas. And we are using this infrastructure that is pretty moldable to different contexts to account for, for these kind of possible connections. So uh, yeah, while the total that you are giving is, is uh, in different contexts with different needs, I think that we are deploying this this super like self-contained, resilient, agile infrastructures that can can help with with the resilience of memory, particularly in places of conflict of conflict. So yeah, will be will be nice to to see how infrastructure that is flexible and adaptable can connect us even if we have different needs and different contexts. That's that's my point. Yeah, maybe in another moment I can show you the 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 project and the behind would be the scenes. wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, that would be really interesting. And I think this is thanks so much, Ofra. It's like a bit of a full circle moment because it also demonstrates it how we do have so much um 
tech and low tech and not so low tech uh, expertise, knowledge and very passionate people in the maker community that can really also tap into a lot of uh, of needs that, you know, also in the in the media maker network, media maker community um, is felt. So there's there's kind of a two way eventually um, yeah, manner to, to come together in, in terms of mutual support, no? Mm -hmm. um, which is something certainly interesting to also unpack further. And obviously an hour of a, con of a conversation of an event cannot give, um, yeah, cannot, is, is never enough to, to tackle the topic or the box we opened here, such important topics and, and so critical topics that, that require very so much more depth and conversation and exchange and detail to really do justice to all the amazing work you guys do and all that is needed in order to support um, and support each other you know, as community and across communities. I also I want to highlight, we are at the end of the session, but um, this is really, session was just meant to get a, a, a stone, you know, the ball rolling or what do you say, the stone rolling? Um, it, it's meant to be the, the beginning of a process and also from gig side, like, and, and with FPU, with Free Press Unlimited, we will follow up on this and, and further explore, like, how, how can we create synergies? Where can we support each other? And how can we, um, on whatever scale, in whatever manner, create meaningful collaboration? So thank you so much, everyone, for your time, for your amazing inputs, for your amazing work that I have just respect for. And yeah, just to say that this is just the beginning. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's so nice to know about all of the work you all are doing. It's very impressive. And about yours, Annie. Very impressive. Thank you. Thank you so much. All of you. Naris, Konstantin, thank you so much. Thank you. See you guys. See you next time. Take care. Goodbye. Bye-bye, everyone. It was amazing. Hopefully, we have another session to keep the discussion. Bye-bye. Hope so. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah.